Good evening, everyone. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, September 11th, 2023 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed from the, uh, for the public and the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Ellis is absent. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchek. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be discussed. Uh, these can be placed in the basket on that table over there to my right. I have a lot of 30 minutes tonight for public comment. All right, we're going to go ahead and start off the day as we always do with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. So we want to welcome Kingsley School. Brewster. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like to bring up Ms. Harold, our um, student council representative chair, and two of our student council reps. Um, we have Abby Brown and Jenna Lee Smith. Thank you so much, Principal Brewster, and thank you, Board of Education, for inviting us here this evening. Um, so because we're in September, it's a little bit unique. Our student council elections at Kingsley are actually happening right as we speak. Um, so mm -hmm. I had the very privilege of inviting last year's student council officers to tell a little bit about what we did last year. What makes Kingsley a little bit unique is the way we run student council is they get to decide what they want to do for the year. So they decide what's important to them and how they want to help their communities out. So so the two ladies in front of me, plus one more, here she comes, um, did an amazing job of planning, organizing, and carrying out some wonderful things to help our community locally and at large. So I'm just going to give them just a few minutes, if you don't mind, just to tell a little bit about what they've done. Okay. Good evening, Board of Education. My name is Alice Cardina, and I was the student council president last year at Kingsley. We are going to share a few highlights from the year. Last fall, we collected food items to donate to Downers Grove Fish Food Pantry. We are proud of all the students at Kingsley for collecting so many items. Hello, my name is Abby Brown, and I was the treasurer last year. During, during the holiday season, we held our annual Kingsley Giving Tree. We hung ornaments and shapes of children on a tree outside the office. Each ornament contained a wish list item from a child in our school community. We were so happy to give to others during the holiday seasons. Hello board, my name is Jenna Leesman and I was our student council secretary. One final big event we held last spring was an all school walk to raise money for JDRF. JDRF stands for Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. It was fun to see students from kindergarten all the way to sixth grade walking together for a good cause. Thank you for inviting us to share a few highlights from our year. Thank you girls. Um, now I'd like to invite up our um, PTA finance officer, Jeff Leesman, to speak on what our PTA does to help support our students and staff at Kingsley. Thanks, Mr. Brewster. Hello, board. I get the honor of both representing the PTA and being a parent of a student here tonight. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's very special. Um, so. The, the big focus of our year last year for the PTA and the Kingsley community in general was our playground project, which I'm sure you all are very aware of. We kicked off our project with an initial fundraiser the weekend after school started last year. And it was great to see the playground done, kids playing on it less than one year later. It was pretty remarkable. Uh, this was a project that our community really rallied around, not just the families of the students got into it as well, uh, staff teachers um, everyone was fully in on this project 100 percent behind it we raised 102 thousand dollars in eight months uh, add that to some some past funds that uh, 
carried over from previous years, about $25,000 there, and combined with the state grant, we were able to, to build this beautiful new playground. One of the features of it is a zero entry spinner that allows uh, wheelchair bound students to seamlessly roll on and enjoy motion play. Uh, it's, I believe it's the second one of its kind in DuPage County uh, and the first in this area, so it's, it's really remarkable. Um, the, <laughs> Thanks, Chuck. So despite the, the, the focus that we had on our playground, we were still able to maintain our normal programming uh, and try to fulfill our mission of supporting families, students, and the school community. Uh, we still hosted our normal array of, of events. Uh, some pictures are on the screen. And we're still able to maintain our normal fundraising levels, uh, which is a testament again to our Kingsley community and who generously funded our playground and our normal operations. Um, some of our, our fundraising approach has been to, to do uh, experiences versus just selling things. Uh, and it gives a chance for, for families and students and parents and staff members to kind of come together, enjoy social events while we're raising money. So that's been extremely successful, something we're continuing on this year um, one of our focus points this year is to increase membership, both with our families and our staff. Uh, we've already seen an uptick, especially in our, our, our staff and teachers joining. Um, so we're, we're well on our way on that one for this year. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Can you? Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I am going to now highlight some of the things that we've been working on as far as the past um, three years is with the school improvement plan. Um, so I'm going to take you on a little journey of where we started and where we're headed. Um, back in 2021, um, the goal was, you know, with differentiation and goal setting, and that was the focus of the year with the uh, school improvement plan. And from there, we moved on to 2022-23 where last year we focused on implementing systems and structures that would help us to you know, continually improve in the area of reading, primarily with our guided reading structures and small group instruction. Um, and then this year, we wanted to go a little deeper with that platform, so working with our instructional leadership team um, and looking at our goals and targets you know, we decided we wanted to go a little bit deeper. So while we have those guided reading structures in place, what are we going to do with those students while they're with us in those small groups? And so one of the things we noticed in our data was that, you know, in our uh, primary grade levels, there was a, a gap in the foundational skills. Um, and in our upper intermediate grade levels, we, we, we noticed that there was a lot of great progress, but kids were not as engaged as they could be. So we wanted to focus more on engagement strategies to help support them in that area, which will also help to carry over into other aspects of their schooling, whether it's math, social studies, science, et cetera. And so I'm going to go back and, and show you a side-by-side -side comparison of our data going back from 21, 22 to 22, 23, so you can actually see the growth that's been um, gained by implementing some of these, these um, strategies. So if I look here, our ELA data from our MAP scores, um, I'm sorry, not MAP, this is from IAR. If you look back on the left, you'll see our 2021-2022 data. You know, there's some good scores there, but we did have a little area of need in our fourth grade. After implementing those guided reading structures and, and um, small group instruction, if you look on the right, you'll see on our 2022-2023 data, we've shown some improvement in those areas, um, some great growth. One of our proudest accomplishments over the time has been our, our growth and um, gains in our subgroups. You know, primarily speaking, like our, our low income, eth our ethnic groups, and um, students with IEPs. So if you look at the data on the left from 2021-2022, You'll see that you know we did have some good scores in there, but there were some areas where we needed to improve, uh, especially with our students with IEPs. So implementing those guided reading structures and small group instruction and, and targeted goals 
um, we saw some growth there and we have all of our students in our subgroups either achieving or meeting or, or exceeding expectations very very big accomplishment there now we look here at our map scores same thing you know back 21-22 uh, the focus was on goal setting um, whether it's with whole class individuals or a small group we saw some gains there um, working on those guided reading structures and implementing small group instruction targeting specific skills we were able to see some growth in our map data right there as well so on the right you'll see the 22 23 data and then finally again we saw a lot of growth in our spring map um, from our 21 22 to our 22 23 um, but on the 22-23 on the right side there, you'll see in our kindergarten spring map, we have that yellow dot. We, we dug deeper into that, and that's where we found that those foundational skills were a little bit lacking. And so that's where we wanted to focus this year moving forward with our um, deeper dive into our small group instruction. And again, another proud moment. We say uh, in our map, rating, our map data, we have a lot of growth in our, our subgroups. I'll let that data speak for itself, but that's, that's a big accomplishment, working on those um, small group instruction and guided reading focuses. Yeah. And I'll turn it over to my assistant principal, Ms. Uh, Lenny Gajewski. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so there's been a lot of accomplishment over at Kingsley last year, previous years, but also even just in the last few weeks so far. So we have a lot that we're going to continue to build off of into this school year. We have a couple pictures up here. Um, first, I want to highlight what's in the middle. And you'll see it's, it's on my shirt, it's up there. This is our theme for this year. It's be kind, be you, and be long. And our number one priority is always making sure that our students are safe, not just physically, but also socially emotionally that they know when they walk into our doors that they have a trusted adult that they can go to that they know that they are seen and that they are cared for so this is something that we we really work off of and build off of one way that we're doing that is with our orange frog uh, committee over at Kingsley they work on culture activities for our staff on PLMs and Institute days and faculty meetings but also broadening that out to our students even more so this year so an example of that is we have a bulletin board that's interactive so as students and staff are going past that there's um, a, a marker hanging on that and so they can give shout outs to each other on there so we really want to bring some of that ownership to our students as well uh, we also have on the right side here, it says expected in that picture. We have principal advisory council and also principals. Mr. Brewster and I are combining those groups this year. We meet every week with these students and it's at lunch and it's a time to just tap into the students, to check in with them, hear about the ongoings throughout Kingsley, and then also get ideas from them. So we want their feedback as leaders, just like our student council over here, of ideas of how we can continue to improve Kingsley. So one thing that this group has done over the the past couple years is our expectations videos our behavior expectations videos to get some consistency in that so they've identified common areas such as the hallways the classrooms even arrival and dismissal and they modeled in these videos expected behaviors and unexpected behaviors and so they continue to update those because the first time we did it they all had masks on so we're evolving that we also have an amazing new playground so we are going to be creating another updated video of that and that goes out to our, our staff and students multiple times throughout the year and then on the left side over there it's our positive office referral form and this is something that has always been <coughs> the absolute highlight of my day we mr. Brewster and I we have positive office referrals where any staff throughout the building whether it's uh, teachers secretaries custodians instructional aides anybody in the building can write a student up for a positive office referral and we bring the students into the office to celebrate with them and we take their picture with their referral and it goes up on a board which has now turned into a hallway of all of our students with their photos and then we call home and truly it's a highlight because the, the children's their faces are just beaming with pride and then you can even hear the parents voices how proud they are to hear about what their child did and they're written up because they've demonstrated kind safe and respectful behaviors but consistently so there are role models throughout throughout Kingsley there 
Um, I think that is most of what we have, but we have a lot going on with our leadership, with our students and, and our staff, so we're looking forward to that throughout this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just one more thing. Stay up there, Ms. Gajewski, if you don't mind. Um, <laughs> I want to congratulate uh, Dr. Gajewski for successfully <laughs> defending her dissertation on <laughs> Friday. <laughs> I told you I'd get you. <laughs> I've been doing this a while. I, I know. Uh, but no, Thank all kidding so aside, um, what a great accomplishment in two years. Yes. Uh, that is something that is just truly remarkable. So on behalf of the Board of Education, District 58, the Kingsley community, Congratulations, we're very proud to have you on our team. And Mr. Brewster, the Kingsley PTA, and the students, teachers, thank you for a great presentation tonight. Yes, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, we have some gifts for you. <laughs> thank you for being here today. Thank you. All right, next on tonight's agenda is a public hearing on the proposed 2023-2024 legal budget. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, Todd Drayfall. <clears throat> this is the, uh, the last step in a, a process that started back in um, November uh, last year when the board took action on the property tax levy. That really is the first step in the budget process for the following year. Um, as a board and, <clears throat> and, uh, and many of the community are well aware that we have a five-year plan process uh, that a lot of the work happens in the spring um, through development of a, of a five-year projection and then a five-year plan that is presented to the board uh, and discussed. Um, this budget is reflection of that work uh, and that process um, that uh, that comes through the year. We want to do a very kind of quick review of, of some of those aspects and, and where we're at currently fiscally and as we're moving forward. <coughs> uh, as with any budget presentation and conversation, we always start with our mission and vision um, to help ground you know, our conversation, what we're doing in, in the pro process and, and uh, what the focus is of, of the resources and how we are allocating them. <coughs> Just as a reminder, um, this budget is, uh, there's a lot of significant adjustments and a lot of things that were done. Um, the big piece, uh, I think, uh, on, from looking at the overall revenue side is that um, we, uh, the, the board, the district, through uh, the process of using the downtown TIF proceeds and delaying it a year uh, and waiting for all of those to come in, uh, has eliminated OKEEP as a, pro as a, as a revenue structure because it was a tuition-based format and putting in place full-day kindergarten. Uh, that didn't change expenditure, uh, but it does remove uh, about $800,000, $900,000 of revenue uh, that came in annually uh, because the system was covering uh, on an annual basis uh, uh, you know, half the salaries for uh, the, uh, the, the staff that were added for that program. Additionally, uh, there are some other resources that were added to, uh, uh, to meet the needs. Um, and those, these are pieces that have all been discussed through the financial plan process. Um, our continual efforts uh, to bring uh, special services uh, in-house and into district and those resources that were added, uh, particularly on a, you know, um, from outplaced positions, uh, occupational therapists, uh, additional teaching staff, and so forth. That is educationally an important piece, but from a budget and financial standpoint, it is also an important piece because of a lot of avoidance of expenditures uh, that we are out of control of. Um, in many cases, the year before, at times, outplaced uh, services were used uh, for aids and so forth that were three, four times what we would have paid for staff uh, because of that. And so there's an impact on that uh, in managing those resources and being able to uh, to do that in house in a company and, and accomplish that. <clears throat> Going through revenue uh, pieces, I remember, you know, as I, I stated about the oak keep. Uh, additionally, uh, registration fees that are set by the board back in uh, January, February, 
we use in inflationary numbers uh, because those, those fees are based on uh, consumables, and consumables uh, rise by inflation. Uh, so what that number is looking like each year is, is based on that. Um, the consumer price index is what, or our property taxes are, it's where the majority of revenue comes from. Uh, for the 2022 and 23 year, uh, those are both at, um, at 5%. Um, that is part of this 2023-24 uh, this uh, revenue. Uh, half of that is based on the property tax bill that is out currently. The other one will be on the one uh, that will be discussed in a few months uh, and that the, the community will see in the spring. Uh, there was a reduction in the corporate personal property replacement tax from the state. It is not back down to where it was historically very low prior to COVID. It is still up considerably, but it did fall about 15, 20% from the prior year. Uh, a lot of that has to do with restructuring of tax systems and how S corporations are taxed um, and shifts in federal revenue and how state does things. Um, that is still a higher level than what we've seen previously historically. Uh, but it did drop some from the from the last couple of years in COVID, where it, it had gone up significantly. Uh, interest income obviously is is a huge piece. Uh, several years ago, we didn't even really put that as an issue because interest rates we just really didn't get any money on on investments. Uh, that is not the case anymore. Uh, so that obviously is, has helped up and come back up. Uh, big piece is the remainder of the ESSER funds uh, to be spent in 2024. Um, <coughs> that's 1.8 million dollars of federal unrestricted funds. Uh, that we have uh, budgeted for, expended, and, and put through. That is all part of the plan. Uh, those are in there, uh, and, you know, for the expenditure for this year, uh, and so we certainly will be using all of that um, going forward, you know, for the, for the year. Uh, also, as we've had a full transportation year, so transportation is paid in arrears, like all state revenue. Um, we, are, we receive funds this year for all of our expenditures based on that last year. Um, I always point that out because in other states that doesn't happen. Some states do it on a quarterly or month-to-month -month basis. In the state of Illinois, it's always a year in arrears. Um, because last year was a full transportation year, uh, kind of a post-COVID piece, we really had an impact. The reimbursement, expenditure, transportation fund, um, it's been a roller coaster through COVID. Um, you know, we had significant drop in expenditures. The next year, we, had, you know, drop in, in 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 revenue, but then we had expenditures come back. Uh, this is the full first year that it's back to a kind of a normal format where we're receiving all of what we had last year, and then we have a normal uh, transportation year uh, based on on that on that factor. So. <coughs> Resources and meeting needs. Uh, we talked about the property taxes and the, and the TIF funding um, that has helped us uh, to come in with the five percent plus uh, whatever the you know those revenues are coming in. Um, we continue to work in the Medicaid um, uh, funding for current services. There's additional funds there. Uh, we are working <coughs> with. Uh, we'll be working continually with SASID, uh, our special cooperative, uh, in that aspect. Um, one of their key staff members who knows that very well was retained and came back um, to work this year, decided not to retire. So we're very happy about that and looking forward to working with her to, to, to get those pieces. We also have as part of this, um, and we continually meet the fund balance policy. I'm gonna talk about that uh, on a couple slides in a minute. And that is simply that we have a 35% fund balance policy that it is, uh, that, as the board is aware, that our ending balance uh, be at 35% of the total uh, estimated operating uh, expenditures. Uh, that is to cover our low cash point. Because we're property tax base, significantly so, uh, we are, and we are dependent upon essentially 40% of our revenue coming in in the last 25, 30 days of our fiscal year. There's a low cash point in uh, May, right before those tax bills come in, you know, the tax bills go, go out, and right before that first distribution from the, from the county comes to us, uh, that's where our low piece, and so that has always been our concern, and having those funds available uh, at that time so that we 
you know, have, op have funds for, to, to cover operational expenses. Um, that is part of that aspect. We'll talk about, I've got another slide on that in a minute. In this budget is a transfer of $500,000 is right now that we are looking at and gearing towards a half a million dollars moving up our operations in the capital. That's to continue our process of building a capital fund so that once all the referendum work is completed in 2027, the district has an accumulation of a, of, of a level of capital fund to continue on out and going forward. Um, in last year's budget, we transferred uh, at, at the end of the year a million dollars out of operations into capital. Um, that's separated. It's going to be invested on a long-term basis because we have no, we do, you know, we're working on a referendum schedule and a capital schedule based on those pieces. That money will be available for the district to use in 27 and 28, and that money plus its interest uh, that can accumulate right now, you know, that will be available as well as as we continually work in this format. Um, right now, we're we're we have a half a million dollars. We hope that through the year, we're able to manage expenses at a level that um, when we come to the board, likely yeah, with an amended budget pieces, and we'll be looking at amending budgets each year during our capital piece because we have a projected what we think we're going to spend on capital um, based on a plan. You know, sometimes those get two or three months delayed or something like that in expenditures when you know, work goes through or so forth. And so we'll make an amended budget at the end of the fiscal year to kind of clean up and straighten those things out. Uh, and at that point, we can make a determination uh, if there's additional funds for this next one uh, to, to go above that $500,000. Uh, as we talk about, you know, going forward and what we look at for the long term and as we build each year in our five-year plan, we use inflationary numbers uh, for those supplies and services, uh, continually looking at what outplacement tuition uh, and, and staffing will be. Um, we do have and we will plan for in fiscal year 25 a three uh, staff reduction, and that's part of that ESSER funding structure. Um, and we've said that, the, you know, we have positions the district has been clear about how it has used its, fe is its federal COVID money in helping students through the process in the last several years. Uh, being that this is the coming towards the end of those funds, uh, we did not receive such a large amount that we were able to do capital work or air conditioning like some districts did, uh, where some had $20 million or something like that. We, we didn't have that level of funding. But we were able to put in enough to cover those expenses during COVID and all those added expenditures during that period of time. And then also additionally using some of these funds to address learning loss uh, and, and, and social emotional needs and so forth. And obviously as those are now ending, so too are the expenditures connected to them. Uh, one of the other pieces is that, you know, as of right now today, we have about 23 letters in of certified retirements coming in between 24 and 27. Not a lot for the next year, uh, but there are some in those other years that are coming in, and those obviously have an impact. There's you know, some very senior veteran staff that we will lose, unfortunately, um, but there's a cost savings to that as well. Um, you know, looking at it from a financial aspect, um, you know, there's a delta, there's a savings and a structure that, that comes to pass. Um, so that will also have, you know, that has an impact as we work through those next projections and going through uh, for 25. Uh, as we've noted in our, our plan, um, electric rates uh, have actually, we've, we've locked those in up through 25. Uh, that will expire at that point. We'll be looking at that. Fortunately, those have come down uh, since some of the high levels they were during COVID. Um, so some of our dealt, some of our earlier projections of impact uh, will not hopefully come to fruition. I'll uh, continue to look at those and work on those and see what those are going to be and obviously project those as we go. Uh, there are obviously increasing, you know, operation rates and so forth that we've worked through. Um, and we've talked about that in our five-year planning. To go back to that 35% fund balance policy piece. <coughs> um, the district, the board, uh, as the board is aware, We've gone through the process of that that low cash point and what is needed. Uh, we've put that into policy. Um, that we are right now today, 
of the budget presented, the plan that we've presented uh, based on all of the, the structures and needs and expectation and estimates. Remember, we, we also budget for a normal Midwestern winter, not extreme winters, be it that there is no snow, and not extreme winters that there are, you know, snowmageddons of 78. Um, one of those is positive on a budget, one of them is extraordinarily negative. Um, you know, but we plan for our normal piece. Hopefully, you know, we're, we're, we come out better off on those. Um, but we plan for those and have some of those expectations as to where that's at. Um, we look to hope to have that, you know, uh, the position to be that we're, we're, we're going to be within that 35% when we're done. Um, but we have the plan in place. One of the things we had with the 35% fund policy, fund balance policy when we talked to the Financial Advisory Committee and when we presented it with the board is we had the debt service fund included into that policy. That was prior to the referendum. The district um, had several years ago uh, a levy structure um, that had to come back down because the levy was exceeded its legal limit. And so what was created was, on an annual basis, a negative balance in that debt service fund. Um, and that negative balance was probably running between four hundred dollars and $500,000 in a year. Um, now, when you look at year end, you would never see it because you have property taxes that come in and right before payment and so forth, so it's always positive. But in that March-April time frame, uh, the time when the low cash point for the operations was, the, that debt service had a negative balance. Um, and that was one of the reasons why we kept debt, debt service and we looked at that 35% <coughs> threshold is knowing we had to address that. We no longer have that situation. Uh, that, that debt, that negative is gone. Um, and the debt service is now a $9 million revenue and expense as we go forward because the new tax uh, you know, those new bonds that were approved um, by the community by a two-thirds vote in November and then approved by the board uh, for sale at the end of December of 2022, you know, are now on the levy structure and, you know, that, that is in there and that is placed. We certainly would not want to put uh, the $9 million expenditure on that fund balance policy because that levy takes care of itself now. Uh, and it would additionally add to a significant draw on the impact on operations uh, and what we could do on things. So, um, so looking at that 35% is something we may want to look at in the next year uh, because it may be that we could go down, you know, it, it may need adjustment. Um, you know, we anticipated and had to deal with the reality as it was at the time uh, and knowing that that had a draw against uh, our funds and had an impact, um, it may no longer be as important or in the case going forward. <clears throat> so looking at the current projection in the budget, we're about 34.7, uh, round up 30, uh, 35. Uh, on an $80 million budget, uh, it's, it's about $250,000, $260,000. Um, that includes contingency for staffing, uh, and, you know, as I talked about the normal winter piece. Um, sub costs uh, due to COVID should be reducing. We have some adjustment for that uh, because we no longer have the COVID days that people can use. Uh, they have to take sick days and so forth. Um, you know, also we have, you know, it's a little more aspect in, in, in structuring. Our staffing has changed as well. Um, I also say that I feel very, uh, of a stronger structure on our staffing level today as they are. Um, we still, get lane changes, we account for some, we have an estimate for those as well that will come in now in the fall for, for staff, uh, but a lot of those have been accounted for in the number that you see presented to you. Um, again, you know, this, the budget is a roadmap and a structure and a spending plan as to what our goals are based on our mission, our vision, our expectations, you know, the community's expectations, and the requirements and the regulations of the state. Um, can you know, we have a impact, you know, we do estimate and put in contingency in special ed uh, funds in, in that area of the budget for additional staffing if necessary, because we can always have an impact there. Um, if we have 
significant impact. You know, we obviously don't have all of that coverage in that piece, and we monitor and maintain. It's also why we then look at that five-year plan and go forward into 25, 26, and making adjustments accordingly, you know, as to what that's going to be. In short, the, you know, the budget is, is balanced. We are actually uh, have a surplus. Uh, the, we'll get to the table in a second. <clears throat> the, the summary recap, um, it does have revenue over expenses uh, in about $4.9 million, $4.85 million um, you know, on the operational side. And so um, you know, it's very strong. And, and that's to help meet that. And then you know, it helped meet that 35% fund balance piece. Um, yeah, we're close within that within that the time that, that framework. So, Todd, can I ask a question on that? Or do you sure. Want to wait till the end. Is that give me a second? Sure. Go ahead. The four point eight eight five million surplus for revenue over expenditure allows us to have a low cash point of what? <coughs> What's the number we anticipate to be the low cash point? Projected. I know that things will. I'll have, I'd have to go back. I'll ha I would. I'm going to have to go back and look and see where that hits. Um, Dr. Russell asked me this afternoon where that look. It, you know, it's it's right before. It's in May. So less about the time. What but about I'm the, trying. I, yeah. I'm trying to remember. I am going to have to go back and look where that number is back. Um, right before the sure. board that no board worries. meeting we can put it in a memo yeah. what my question underneath the question is how do i size the 4.85 million dollar revenue over expenditure which is about five percent of our total budget and that feels high to be and again i don't know how to size it so like my gut right. feels like oh that feels high and i don't know if that's an accurate way to read it when we went when we i don't know if i'm gonna be able to answer your question exactly but here's here's the conversation to, to kind of retract, go back to the conversation discussion that the financial advisory committee had um, 18 months ago when we started talking about fund balance policy and how we came to the 35. We went back and looked at what, you know, where we're trending and what we needed to have on hand to essentially cover payroll um, and account, you know, essentially cover payroll. Um, with that low cash point. Um, you know, the conversations we have had in the past was there were times in 2018, 2019, particularly, where, uh, and this is, this is as I was coming in, the year before I came in, the year after I came in and after, where we had, the example was we had a million dollars in the bank on Friday. We had a payroll charge on Wednesday. The payroll was due the next Friday. We charge the account on Wednesday. Yeah. On Monday, we would have the early tax distribution from DuPage County. Now, thank, fortunately, there are a couple of things you can set your watch with, and that is an early payment and the time structure for property tax bills and property tax distribution, at least early distribution, in DuPage County. To my knowledge, over 20-some-odd years, I don't remember them ever being late. Um, 30 plus years, they've never been late. They've always hit those time frames. But our point was, that's a really, that's just not something we should be playing with, right? Um, and so we went to determine what is it we need to have, where, and then went forward to how do we find a factor and a structure that we could easily put into a policy and monitor and manage. And we came to the point of let's look at end fund balance and revenue and, and, and expenditure. And through imaginations, discussions, and conversations, we came to, and again, the accounting and that debt, you know, with all of those pieces, that 35% piece. Um, because we knew we needed to have that, that format to cover uh, at that low cash point piece. Um, what does that mean when? We're going to, you know, it means we have several million dollars. It means we have three, four million dollars, five million dollars in the bank um, when that time comes so that we can cover those in the event that DuPage County, for some reason, doesn't hit the Monday and yeah. we have to charge you. Yeah. 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 Yeah
And Member Doshi, that's a great question because as Todd alluded to, I, I asked the exact same one. And so in the update this week, we'll get you guys that exact dollar amount. Um, it's not only about having enough cash on hand, it's also making sure um, that we have enough in fund balances to help with our overall credit rating. So that's something that we're looking for. So when we were going through the referendum trying to secure the best rate on the bonds, one of the pieces of feedback that we have is yes, you are heading in the right direction fiscally, but your district needs to save more money. The other thing that I look at is not necessarily just a year by year, is, is four million too high or is it too low? What is our aggregate in terms of cash on hand, number of days that we have in the overall fund balance to ensure that heaven forbid if the state decided not to pay us, um, which isn't that far-fetched from uh, history, that we've got enough in the bank um, to make sure that we could do that. So when we're looking at our fund balance, you know, overall policy, you're looking at about $28 million right now, and, and again, rounding. Um, so when you look at that overall picture, that doesn't give you a lot of cash on hand uh, days. So that's also something that we're really trying to take a look at. The other thing now that interest rates are higher, we are looking at uh, a piece of revenue for the district based on our investment. So the more that you have in the bank, you know, a reasonable amount, uh, the better off we are going to be. In terms of when you look at it, you know, are, are we taxing too much? Are we saving too much? I always look toward our adequacy number that we get from the state of Illinois. There are some districts that have 130% or 150% adequacy uh, number. And that means the state's saying you're 130% over what, what you need to be spending for adequacy. We're right around that 100%, um, which is exactly where we want to be, give or take a little bit. I know I'm 105, but right? yeah. <laughs> and, and so to me, we're getting to that correct amount, but we're, we're not quite there yet when you look at the cash on hand, when you look at our adequacy target, and when you look at what we need to keep in the bank for investments and also for that rainy day and or, uh, you know, to have enough um, to, to meet payroll. So we'll get you that dollar amount, uh, the low cash on hand, but there's several factors that come into play that we continue to talk about. And on top of that, one of the things that we review in FAC and the reason why it's a percentage is so when we have these years where there's a high CPI change and a high expense change, you're going to see a high shift in that number. So one of the ways that we've kind of talked about it on the Financial Advisory Committee is that us hitting that fund balance is actually us balancing the budget. When, we, when Greg and I first got on the board and you kind of followed you know, quickly thereafter, we were in a deficit and then we got ourselves to balance, but we realized that just by balancing our budget, we were only a couple of years away from being in, in big trouble because as our expenses went up, our, our fund balance wasn't there to sort of make up the difference. That shortfall, we were, you know, we were dipping into that further and further, and that dollar amount, if that payment would have been a couple of days late, we wouldn't make payroll. Or I mean, we would because we'd go out for, for a tax anticipation warrant, but we don't want to do that. And when we were looking at all the bonds, and not even these bonds, but the bonds when we did the last year and stuff as well, we were looking at our, our rating, a lot of that had to be with how stable are you? And one of the things they looked at was our fund balance. So there are going to be years that you're going to see that look like a couple of million dollars and other years where if it would have been like the, uh, you know, 2018 year where what CPI was less than 1%, you know, uh, closer to zero, right? Um, and so if you looked at those years, it would have been a significantly smaller kind of add on to the fund balance because our expenditures uh, didn't go up much that year, you know. So that's why it's a. That's why we kind of locked it in at thirty-five percent. We looked at it a couple of different ways. Like, all right, if our expenses go up, our fund balance should go up in an equal percentage. But the the, the easiest way when we kind of broke it down was to say uh, it should be at at, at thirty-five percent. And yeah, there's a lot of school districts that I think are closer to fifty, which I know is I know what. Um, <laughs> What we were hearing Certainly, from what, yeah. What, what Moody shared with us is, is in order to get the highest rating, um, they would like to see a little bit more in our fund balances there. Um, in with a second bond issuance coming up here, uh, with the referendum money, that of course is a, is a target. I, I can't guarantee that we're going to no, get the highest rating, but to at least maintain our rating right now. But I mean, we actually, it, as much as it's going to be weird for a couple of years now because our, our budget is going to look strange, right? Because if you actually look at our total budget. It looks like we're in the red because our bond funds come in in one year, right? And then, um, and so it looks like we're what, twenty-two million dollars or something mm -hmm. in, in yeah. the red. So but I pulled up the, I, I put the, um, <laughs> the recap on. Um, <clears throat> one of the, though this looks like lots of numbers and it is, 
Um, the nice part about this, uh, this tool that we've continually used is it gives you the beginning position, um, the source of the revenues, uh, your, op your expenditures by Azure by Fund, and then we break it out by the operating funds and, you know, and then the overall. And certainly on the overall, we will be in that position because of the capital fund, right? We, we have proceeds, uh, we have a large fund balance, uh, capital fund will be spending in a deficit until those funds are gone, and then we're going to borrow, have a next issuance and cover, and then do the same. Uh, but the operating side, the operating fund total, um, you know, shows where we're ending in the position of 4.85, um, you know, to the good, and that includes the half a million dollar transfer uh, that you see out of the education fund into uh, capital, um, which is essentially you know moving that out of the operation area. <clears throat> you have negative fund balances or spend downs in some of the funds because we have a $4 million budget in the O&M fund and we have a $4 million um, balance. And so we ad adjust the tax levy over years to kind of equalize out and kind of push more towards the education fund that has the, you know, the majority of the, of the expenditures. And so we'll do that. We'll have to realign some things. Uh, transportation will have to kind of come back again. That's been at that yo-yo piece, and we'll level that out. But it takes a couple fiscal years because of the way the levy structure works and the, the way the reimbursements work. Uh, so, you know, we just kind of we have to, have to take that over some time uh, just to level it out. But in, in, at the end of the day, uh, the position is that we're in a, you know, we have to be very mindful to get within the 35 percent we are you know round up to the 35 or we're 250,000 off um, on a 79 million dollar budget we will continually manage and, and maintain and work that we understand that you know looking at the 630 cash position um, that a year-to-date report that was maybe a, you know, a concern because it ended up on a cash basis under that 35. Um, we don't have final accruals yet. We have an estimate, um, but I wanted you know, we, we do a budget on cash. Um, we report our audit on a modified accrual. Uh, and so we've got some pages on this presentation that review quickly some of the differentials that we have had in cash versus accrual. We have federal revenue that comes in back and forwards, uh, expenditures that, that hit at different times and gets, gets done. We have an estimate for the ending year 23 um, to kind of give you a sense as to what that differential is. You can see where uh, 2019 through 2023, even with its estimate, um, accrual is always slightly, the ending balance is higher uh, than cash. Uh, that's just because of the, the revenues that roll backwards mm -hmm. uh, and, a, and alignment adjustments. So 630, we had we didn't have so much the property tax piece that shifted because we had revenue that, you know, that worked out. But we had a number of expenditures in the 23 budget that kind of doubled up because we paid something in July on cash and we paid something in July 2021. Sorry. June. 20. July 2022, and we paid another cash bill in June 2023. That was a million one in bills for transportation. The net is a hundred thousand dollars because one was the prior fiscal years and one was you know. So that throws off the position on cash, and and you know I've, that's why we have the modified accrual audit when it comes out, um, and it aligns all of that up. Um, but and. We are very fortunate in the way that we try to be conservative in how we run it, such that the accruals have in the in the, in the audit when it comes out is in a better position than what we're than what we continually work for and what we're looking at and looking at and planning for, so that we are never in a position that we're going to surprise. We have a a negative surprise somewhere in mid year, and that is your longest budget hearing. Right, questions. Any other questions, comments? Before I open this up public. Okay, so we're going to do board comments and then public comments. Yeah. I think we'll make so um, I just want to I want to frame my comments in a very positive way because um, I do have some concerns, um, but I just want to make sure that there, that my my praise for where we've come in the district isn't lost. 
Um, as, as Darren, you stated, when, when the three of us were new on the board, we were passing um, unbalanced budgets, and our, our surpluses were, when we finally had some, were in the hundreds of thousands, and now we're looking at surplus in the millions. Um, and that, that is a, it, it is a, a great feat that the district has turned itself around and right of the ship financially over the last uh, several years. So I'm, I'm very, very pleased about that. Um, the one thing I would, I just, um, again, I, I am enthusiastic about the new programming bringing on. I, I was a big supporter of all-day kindergarten for, for years and years. Um, I, I have no concerns about um, any specific one item that we've added to the plate this year. I guess uh, my, the one, my concerns are is we have the, the fund balance policy of 35% and we are, we're close and we're off by a quarter million dollars and at the end of the day that's not that big of a deal um, when you're talking about an $80 million budget. I get that as well. I guess my concern looking forward is, is that if the fund balance policy has to mean something because otherwise if this board says, meh, if we're off by a quarter of a million, that's fine. The next board might say, well, if we're off by a million, that's fine. And then, and then you know, little by little, the slope gets a little slipper, more slippery. And then over time, we are back to where we were, where we have, um, where we, 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 we've already identified the problems that our, our, uh, our tax base just isn't as, as large, or our, our, uh, our tax rate isn't as large as, as other districts in the area. So we know that we're always going to have this, this revenue problem with local property taxes being the, the lion's share of our revenue. So I don't want to um, get comfortable <coughs> with the idea of, um, of not hitting that 35%. So I would, um, and, also, and also we are missing, and I, I get it, we're averaging out because we put in a million last year and now we're only putting $500,000 last year, even though we, our goal is 750. I understand that, that's, a, that's an important piece that I'm not going to overlook, but I want to make sure that um, I guess my challenge to the administration would be um, we've added a lot mm -hmm. and we're always talking about, we, well, we're, we're, and we're adding great things. And I have, again, no criticisms for anything we're, we've, we've added. I think everything is really good and important for our kids. However, we never talk about um, well, what, what can we take away. So I, I would like to um, make sure that as we go forward, uh, as, as this board and future boards continues to lead this district that we are adhering to that 35 percent policy and um having conversations around you know when, when we miss like we like we are on paper missing this year and, and i know todd you, you budget very conservatively so it's very likely at the end of the year that we will hit 35 but when we do miss like we are now we're starting to have conversations um now because we're going to be talking about our, our levy in a month or two. So start having that conversation now about, well, we need to make sure that we hit that 35% target next year. And what, what, are the, what are the levers that we have, that we are able to move now? Um, what are the conversations we need to start having now in order to um, make sure that the legacy of this board is, is fiscal responsibility and we are not, we, we're not gonna be like, okay, we got everything right and then things started to kind of slip away. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that that um, that what the things we put in place, all the changes we made, are going to set this district up for many, many years of financial success, which uh, which is what our, our community and our children deserve. Ty, can you go back to slide ten or James? Thank you. Great. Um, so one of the things is we kind of skipped over at the end, um, and I think this directly will answer your question, Member Harris. Um, one of the the slides that we put in here is. We know we must continue to be mindful of the fund balance policy. <coughs> what a budget is, is it, it's a spending plan, right? The actual dollars come at the end of the year. Did you do it or, or did you not? And so we need to be mindful of this. Um, we are already having conversations. And when you build a budget, we do put a lot of contingencies in there. Sometimes you put those contingencies in there because they actually happen and sometimes they don't, right? Um, as Todd alluded to with staffing or personnel. We think some of our staffing contingencies are probably a little high. We don't know what's gonna happen in the winter though with, with plowing snow and things like that. So obviously we have to be a, a little bit careful. But one of the, the, the two bullet points we have uh, after the fund balance policy is, you know, we'll, we will likely have to reduce spending in areas this year and in the coming years. Now, how are we going to do that? We're going to identify those in the administration. We're going to get input from our staff. We're going to continually use the FAC and the Board of Education to have those conversations throughout the school year. As we look at the um, year-end reports and the monthly reports, that's how we can tell 
if we're on track with hitting the fund balance policy if we're not. So we need to really look at those every single month and make sure that we're doing our due diligence. Um, you know, the other thing is we just need to continue like we always have. And, and you know, yes, Todd talked about the TIF, and that's been a major reason why we've been able to do things, but I'll also make a strong argument. The reason we've been able to do so much in the last four years is we really have targeted inefficiencies in our system, and we've been able to turn those dollars back around for kids and give our kids and staff things that they haven't been able to do. We've also identified a ton of grants out there that previously weren't, we weren't able to do, whether that's for computers or whether that's inside our title funds, and so we need to continue to do that. Just look at the um, maintenance projects. Well, and Darren and I were chatting about this earlier. Yes, it's only $50,000 a year, but when you do that over four years, that's $200,000. And so we're starting to really enjoy a lot of those grants and we need to continually go for that. The one word of caution I have, and this is for us as administrators, as the school board and as the community, you know, we will continue to operate in a, in a very efficient manner. And this always happens in every district that I've ever worked in. Um, the, the cautionary tale here is the revenue is here, but sometimes the expectations from the community can be up here, right? Everybody wants the smallest class sizes. And, and you're going to see that reflected in the budget today. And I want the smallest class sizes too. But there's a limit to that. Um, everybody wants a full-time nurse, a full-time social worker in every building. And I want all of those things too. We just have to be careful that the wants don't get to the point where we no longer can afford to save money and hit the targets that we've established because they're, they're really designed in, in order to protect us so we don't end up back in a situation like we were in 1718 or 1819 in those. So that's our word of caution here. We, we've done so many great things over the last few years. Trust me as an administration, we hear the concern. We hear the yes, we're in a, we are in a very good spot compared to where we are, but it's not all sunshine and rainbows and we have to make sure that we're very careful, we watch our dollars and cents, we trim where we can, we get grants where we can to make sure that we hit that 35% uh, percent because that's there for a reason. And, we, and um, you know, we've already been having conversations with our full admin team, including the building principals, and then of course with our district office team as well. Can I ask one question? Can you back up, I think, just one slide maybe? Um, maybe one. No, maybe maybe one more. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you don't have them all memorized. I yeah you know, <laughs> yeah that's the one. Um so and I don't know this is probably more of a Kevin or administrative yeah. less than a Todd question. Um where it says includes contingency for three added staff members. Yeah. Is that referencing replacing perhaps into the budget that three ESSER paid staff? What would can you no, what that clarify is, that a little bit? Is because we have. Um, a neighborhood school concept. Mm -hmm. We are never certain where our class numbers are mm -hmm. ultimately going to pan out. <coughs> and so what we do throughout the, you know, the budgeting process is we make sure that we put in those just in case we have a, a high section that might pop or at the middle school. You know, Spanish is a great example over the last couple of years. We've had so many kids take Spanish, we didn't want to cut it off. Mm -hmm. We put contingencies in place um, for that. Those three staff positions that you're referencing, mm -hmm. those were specifically designed to address learning loss through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Now, if there was a need for those moving forward, which there very well could be, mm -hmm. um, we are gonna have to find that money elsewhere in the budget. And so those are also conversations that we're having. And, and so if we're gonna do that, then that means that we have to look at the materials that we're purchasing. We have to look at other services, maybe some professional development opportunities that we've been doing in a way what's more important. Mm -hmm. Is it those three staff positions or is it something else? So what that is for is, is that's primarily for class size to give us a cushion. Okay. Um, the other three positions that you're talking about were, were ESSER identified mm -hmm. and we'll continue to look at those through our state grant applications and things like that. Really what, what I would hope, Emily, is that we can find other grant opportunities to continue to support uh, those positions because yes, we have um, done a great job uh, addressing learning loss um, that goes to a credit to our staff. But we want to make sure that we maintain that and so how do we find those things so um we are having those conversations perfect i appreciate you saying that just because that's what was going to be my point exactly is that we like as we just saw in the kingsley presentation look at the strides they were able to make especially with their subgroups which we talk about all the time that we want to see that growth in the subgroups in particular and i would assume that a lot of that um those ESSER positions, interventionist social work support all those things that we really have put a focus on we don't want to see 
a backward slide when those funds are gone. Let's try to find a way to continue to keep those people in their positions and continue to make that growth that we've been seeing over the past couple of years. And I think that's super important and I just don't want to see that go away. Yeah. So. And therein lies the challenge that we have, right? Yep, uh, how exactly. do we be efficient? But everything that we've added, I'm going to make a strong argument. There is absolutely no fluff. Those, those were yep. really well thought out decisions that people said, no, we have to have them and look at the results. And, and yep. so it, it is challenging. Um, but I, I do believe we can continue, just like we always have, to find those efficiencies mm -hmm. in our system while we're still trying to keep some of those things that we, we added on. Mm -hmm. uh, because we all believe, and when we add things, when we write, make those recommendations, outside of these ESSER positions, because that was unique, when we talk about full day kinder retirement, we want to make sure that we add things permanently and not have to come back three or four years mm -hmm. later and say, well, you know what, we don't have the money for that anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, then at this time I declare the, uh, the hearing open to allow members of the audience to comment on this topic. Anyone wishing to be heard, please stand, come to the podium, state your name, attendance area, and or organization, uh, if any, for the record. It's now open. All right. Doesn't appear that there's any comments, so I'm going to go ahead and declare the hearing now closed at 8.01 p.m. <laughs> All right, next up, listed on tonight's agenda are five communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? Okay, and that brings us to the spotlight in our school. Uh, the owner's representative. No, where is that first one? Spotlight's name, Roman. Oh, oh that I just did change it. Okay. Oh, it's the enrollment update. Sorry, sorry, enrollment update. update. <laughs> <laughs> enrollment staff. Enrollment I will not be talking about construction. <laughs> <laughs> Get excited the <laughs> that would be fun. You made everyone behind me very nervous. Tonight, I'm just going to give a, a brief update. At this point in the year, we are we are at the point where we have seen all of the registrations and school offices have reopened, and so this is a chance for us to take a look at where we're at in terms of enrollment and staffing across the district. We continue the same priorities we've discussed for many years, and that were actually part of the previous presentation. We've set targets that we want to see 80 percent of our classes in K2 having. 24 or fewer students, and at least 80% of our classes in grades 3 through 8 having 26 or fewer students. Obviously, we want to continue to balance class sizes as best we can so the range doesn't get too wide. We want to make sure that there are quality supports and services across all of our instructional environments, and we want to continue to hire highly qualified child-centered educators for all positions, which this year in a couple of places caused us to do some reconfiguration of some certified plans when we realized that at some point the candidate pool wasn't producing for a couple of our specialized program positions, the quality of candidate that we wanted to hire in District 58, and so we did a little bit of reconfiguring to make that work based on the, the, the staffing that we had available. This slide takes a look at our overall total enrollment. So you'll see when we add everything up this year, we're at, as of last Tuesday, we're at 4,826 students, a slight decrease from the past two years, but really within 1% of what we've been post-COVID. So that is, even though we see it, it, you know, that 4,800 versus 4,900 looks a little lower, it's still a, a pretty close variance in terms of what we're looking at overall. Um, a slightly larger eighth grade class, a slightly smaller kindergarten class right now, and then just a couple of variances across the board. But nothing significant or any trends that are going to change the course of way, the ways we're looking at things. This slide, the first three rows across, just look at our general education classrooms in grades K through six. So in those in classrooms, you'll see total enrollment by school, the average class size by school, and then the range of class size by school. And as you can see, those are, are pretty consistent across the board. Obviously, there's with the neighborhood school model, there's always going to be a bit of fluctuation, but we are, we are seeing those consistent numbers um, with the ranges you know, staying within the targets in many schools and right at the targets or slightly above in a couple. Then that last row across the bottom shows us what the total number of students in each building on a given day looks like. So there's where we add in dual language, rise, best, DLP, preschool. 
And the reason that we don't put those into the first few columns is because by design, those class sizes are structured very differently. So if you start to, they would start to change the average class sizes and the range of class sizes in those buildings. So again, the first three rows, general education classrooms, grades K through six, the bottom row includes all students in a building on a given day. And then the number at the very bottom we have, which will be demonstrated better in the next slide, 97% of our classrooms in grades K through six are at or below the class size targets for 23-24, which is a goal that the, the board has set for us for the past few years. This slide demonstrates each section at each school as of last Tuesday and then also puts right next to it the number of students in any special or specialized program that are in that building. So as you look across, the blue highlighted numbers indicate the five sections across District 58 that are above the class size target. The first grade at Henry Puffer, the fourth grade at Hillcrest, and then the three sixth grade classrooms at Leicester. In all of those cases, we're in ongoing conversations as we're in the third week of school. Initially, principals and staff said we don't, we don't see the need for a specific additional support right now, but as we're getting to know the needs of the students in those groups, we are continuing the conversation to make sure that if some additional instruction supports become appropriate, we are able to move through that. The other thing this will demonstrate is if you look, for example, at Indian Trail Kindergarten, you'll see classes of 20 and 21, but there are nine Kindergarten Rise students at Indian Trail. So in a moment where all five students or all four students came into those classroom, into those general education classrooms, those classes would approach or or usurp the target just a little bit. However, it's very rare based on the individual student programming that all of that would happen at once, particularly at this time of the year. And when those students do join the general education classroom as part of their individualized programming, typically additional adult support does come with those students at that point in time. This slide just captures the enrollment of all of those other programs that I referenced. You can see both the configuration, the total number of students in those programs, and kind of what it looks like in each building. You'll see a couple of places where the numbers are a little higher. For example, the K-1-2 class in DLP at Hillcrest, there are actually two certified teachers working in that classroom to ensure that our ratios stay similar um, across the board. Also, obviously, many of these classes are supported by instructional assistants as we go through. You'll see our, our two dual language classes that are two-way dual language, which is now kindergarten and first grade, are really approaching typical class sizes, whereas some of those numbers of the one-way program that is working its way through our system remain a little bit on the lower side as we go through, and that's why we continue to work through some of those as combination type classrooms in the one-way dual language program. We also would notice that this is the first year we have a RISE program at the middle school, so that's new at Herrick this year, with the seventh grade class opening in that building this year. Just uh, wondering on the dual language classes, a prerequisite for being in the first grade dual language is that you were in the kindergarten or you can enroll in that, in that year? The, uh, typically it would be, the way we've approached it is if you were in the previous kindergarten class or if you have come to District 58 from a dual language program. That is, that's, that's the way we handle enrollment to the current classroom. Thank you. <coughs> Here are our middle school numbers across the board. So again, we'll see a total of 1,055 middle school students this year in seventh and eighth grade. At Herrick, we have 100% of our classes at 26 or below this year. And at O'Neill, we have 90%, and it kind of breaks down just where those are. There are six sections where the classes above the target are co-taught, which means two certified staff members working in those classrooms. There are two sections of PE that are slightly over the target, and then there are two science class, or excuse me, three science classes at 27 students, which while over the target is still well within the district target that's set, and really a lot of that was the result of some different programming actually for our dual language students where we placed that in the day which, which locked in some sections and is something that we'll continue to review going forward. Both the, the O'Neill administrators and I are very confident that we can see all of this closer to 100% next year in both buildings. And again, this is the result of adding, as, as Todd mentioned in his slides, a little extra support in PE and in Spanish to make sure that we could keep all of those sections at or below the target. Justin, can we just maybe Absolutely. go back to that slide? The, the numbers that jumped out the most to me on this entire slide deck was just the 100 versus 618 and the 90 versus 437. I, I would think that if we have fewer students, we'd be able to kind of, you know, 
get to that 100% easier in O'Neill versus Herrick. But it actually still comes down to how you allocate the FTE over there and, and what that looks like. And so, you know, in, in many cases, like those co-taught classes are ELA classes, like you said, where you've got a, a resource teacher and a, an ELA teacher there. Adding, you know, sometimes adding an additional section with a smaller population actually changes the economy. The economy of scale is actually a little bit easier with a bigger population because you have more staff members already to distribute the students a month. Now, to be sure, there are many classes at Herrick that are 24, 25, and 26. You know, the target, it's at or below. So, and, and most of these at O'Neill are, are one or two above. But it really, it, it comes down to keeping the staffing relatively tight at, in the spring as we're looking through things. I'll give one example in PE. As we were looking, we still have two sections that when you add them up are are closer to 28 and 29, but we had a part-time PE teacher at Herrick who was teaching three periods that when we were looking at things in the weeks before school started, we actually spent just a little bit of that 3.0 contingency to increase that part-time PE to pick up a section at O'Neill, which allowed us to bring some of those class sizes down. So it just really, it really is looking that closely and, and keeping that type an eye on the budget and the staffing numbers all the way through. I got you. I don't know, I, I guess I, maybe I can get talk offline, but I'd like to understand that a little bit more. I, I just, yeah. it still doesn't, I'm not grasping why we, we still have that 10% gap at a building where we have that fewer of students. Sure, I mean, I, it would, I, I, the easiest way to do it would probably be to actually kind of break down what do those class periods look like, because it also really has to do with the number of teachers you have available teaching any classes during a given class period in the day. So the average class size at O'Neill is, is, is well below the target. It's those individual sections because of the way the master schedule gets put together that sometimes force your hand in terms of students who are in specific programs and therefore need to be in certain classes during certain class periods. I don't know if this will help, um, and please push back on <coughs> if I'm not characterizing right. I think one of the things that makes scheduling at O'Neill a bit more challenging is you have more specialized programs. And so when you have more specialized programs, you don't have as many options as, as when you're um, pushing kiddos into the general education classroom that can only go in during certain periods. And so what can end up happening, as Justin just alluded to, is you can have some class periods. Um, this would happen to me when I was a teacher that might be at 26, 25, 26, 27, where I might have others at 18, 19, and 20. So the average class size, when you do it across the board, is well within the range, but because of certain times when kids are pushing in or, or they're not pushing in, that could cause some <coughs> periods to go a little higher than, than others. Okay. But we are more than happy to, to sit down with the you know piece of paper. Yeah, I guess so, like, it, mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think of it from a, if a parent were to view this, right? Mm -hmm. And if I'm a parent at O'Neill, I see a 10% gap, right? Um, but if I'm a parent at Herrick, they're like, oh, okay, all my class, any class at my students and is going to be a lower level. And so I'm just, I know this is meant to actually like make us feel good that we're actually, but I, I still think that this doesn't tell the full story as to why that we do have that 10% gap. I, I know we're trying to explain it away with those three um, bullets at the bottom, but I don't know. I think it comes. I think it I, comes I still don't feel good about this. Yeah, no, I, I think the number that I would sit down with parents if, if they had a concern, um, because certainly you know we look at both middle schools with equity lenses, right? We mm -hmm. want to make sure that kids are getting the same experience at, at both of our middle schools. Um, I think as Justin alluded to, the, that average class size, that number, I think can really help put people at ease that kids are getting an equitable experience. However, due to scheduling, um, in singletons we call them in the, the scheduling process, you are gonna have some classes that are gonna be a little higher than others. Uh, being a former middle school teacher, I live this all the time. Um, but it balances out at the end um, because when you look at that overall class size number, I, I do also want to echo what Justin said. I know it, it, it is a little counterintuitive. Sometimes when you have a smaller school, but you combine that with more specialized programs, you're creating more singletons, which makes scheduling a little harder. Where at Herrick, if you have less specialized programs and more teachers available, you can actually 
schedule a little bit easier because you have more options that are available than you do at a smaller school. Well, and you need to include beyond specialized programs. If a student is in gifted reading language arts mm -hmm. and accelerated math, there is one option for the two periods of language arts. And there are maybe two options at O'Neill just based on the numbers mm -hmm. for that accelerated math class. And so now that leaves me with only the remaining class periods to fit in everything else. And so if enough students fit those molds, then that means I may have to overload load science class A and again, we're talking about a one to two student difference, right, when we're missing the target. Like, we're talking about the target is 26, yeah. and a class no, no, that misses the okay. target has one extra student. So, are we saying that the class size is actually, the average class size is more important than that 90% versus 100%? The board, or strategic plan established target, is 80% of our classes at or below the target. So, we look at that. We've, that's prescribed as each individual class. So those 11 sections represent the 11, the 11 class periods at O'Neill mm -hmm. out of 120-ish that are above 26 students. It, I mean, we, we could really break it down further and say how many are at 26, how many are at 25, how many are at 17, and, and that range exists in there as well, again, for a variety of reasons based on the way scheduling goes and the way we put it together. If you were to add one additional science teacher, you would drop those 27s to like 18, 19 in some cases, and so then it becomes a question of is that the best allocation of resources, and it's difficult to find a science teacher to teach one class period. Do you know what I mean? Like that's a difficult hire. And so sometimes you have to say, it's different than splitting an elementary class where you're hiring a full-time teacher to split that class. Here, you're talking about you know, the solution being either going a student over the target or looking for someone who's available to teach one period a day. You know? and, and we found a couple of people to teach part-time PE and part-time Spanish, but those are really challenging hires. Okay, thank, thank you. Sure. Just out of curiosity, it, it there used to be a big difference between Herrick and O'Neill. It's is a seventh grade class really small, a lot smaller as a whole this year. Uh, there used to be like I used to joke that it was the entire El Sierra population bigger at. I always said that at all these board meetings, and it doesn't seem like that's the case anymore. Yeah, I mean you can see this year. This year's seventh grade class is a little bit smaller, actually, across the board than our than our eighth grade class, mm -hmm. and you know. But the discrepancy you're still looking at, you know, 180 ish students or something like that. So it's still, you know. But again, that's where <laughs> the overall enrollment numbers do start to shift. So okay, yeah. just curious. Yeah. Herrick is down students uh, this year, not not down significantly, but certainly down students. Again, one of our targets is just to ensure that we're providing the support that students need. And so this just gives a breakdown of where that FTE is. Remember, FTE doesn't always mean number of people. Sometimes an FTE means you're spending half of your day as a teacher librarian and half of your day as an elementary interventionist. But this just gives us an idea of where we are seeing that support across the district. Most of this very consistent year over year. Some increase in the resource teachers for specialized programs as a response to the reality that we've had trouble staffing and finding enough at the same number number of instructional assistants that we had in prior years, so that's a reconfiguration. And then an increase of bringing more of our occupational therapists into district rather than um, contracting them through SASA. Whenever we talk about staffing and enrollment, we also just look at space. And I think that you know we continue to, this is very similar to what we talked about a year ago. We haven't seen a significant change in space impact, but it is something that we do need to always take into account as we bring more specialized programs into district, as we create smaller class sizes, which means more sections of art, more sections of music, and, and more spaces being utilized over the course of the day. I think that it, it's important to recognize that we really are at capacity and over capacity in, in some buildings. And while we are looking forward to the elementary shift of sixth grade classrooms moving, in many of our buildings, that's going to bring us back to having enough room simply to have art and music off a cart and things like that, and isn't necessarily going to open up three and four classrooms that we can now do super <coughs> creative things with. In a couple of buildings it might, but it really is more like a couple. We're seeing a lot more band and orchestra classes happening in conference rooms and on stages while PE is happening and things like that, just because we, we really are continuing to monitor space. And it's just a part of the conversation we continue to have with all of the things that we are working through. 
overall, again, vast majority of classrooms are below class size targets. We are proud to be fully staffed in certified positions. As I mentioned, we did end up with a slight reconfiguration in specialized programs. It, rather than um, taking candidates that we weren't as confident in as certified staff, we did a little bit of reconfiguration in mid-August. We currently have seven unfilled instructional assistant positions. That's out of 94 district-wide, and so it, it's always concerning to have unfilled positions, but it's also a better position than we've been in. We've been fortunate at the beginning of the year that substitutes have come in to cover a lot of those positions. That will start to fall off as there are more and more teacher substitute positions available in multiple districts. There just aren't typically as many at the beginning of the year. And so we're continuing to look at ways to approach both the unfilled positions as well as wanting to make sure that we are filling those or able to fill those with substitute positions. Our, our teacher sub positions are almost always 100% filled right now and even looking forward to when committee meetings will begin though we're trying to lessen the impact with those we know we'll have some and projecting forward we're seeing nearly 100% fill rates for teacher sub positions we're not seeing 100% fill rates for those IA sub positions and so we're working on ways to approach that and and I, I anticipate we may be bringing some suggestions about some of those things to the board in the coming months just to make sure that we're doing everything we can to bring staff in to support the students where we've identified those needs to be and as we do every year we'll continue to monitor things the enrollment numbers are our five students different than they were last Tuesday as I just happened to look at it today as I was preparing this so you know again none of that has an impact that will that will cause a, a change or motion right now but but things can change in the year as time goes on and so we want to make sure we're continuing to monitor all of that any questions thank you just go, I, I did go back and look at last year's report just to see you know kind of the, the, the targets that we were hitting um, Last year at O'Neill, we were at 89% in terms of the target that we were hitting, so we stayed pretty consistent, and Herrick was at 70%. So it does fluctuate sometimes, kind of what we were, what we were saying. Um, so, but to get it to 100%, uh, you know, Justin, I want to compliment you in your first year. That, that's a pretty, pretty good goal. I think we'd all like to see it at 100%, but um, it does flip-flop sometimes between the two buildings, but we'll continue to look at ways of efficiently scheduling. One other thing that I wanted to add, um, we have a newer administrative team at both of our middle schools, and so we do um, intend to offer them professional development on middle school scheduling and things like that to try and continue to build as many efficiencies as uh, possible. As a former middle school and an elementary administrator, and I know Justin was too, scheduling is challenging, mm -hmm. uh, but we will continue to make sure that we, we do that and uh, to, to try and get as many of those class size targets as possible. Thank you. This just reminds me of, uh, maybe I have been told this, but where do we stand with the demographers' reports? Like That's a that great update? question. We actually <laughs> talked about that at uh, DLT. So in the plans this year, we do plan on, and it's actually written in one of the action plans, the draft action plans for the strategic goals, is to solicit another demographer's report. The last one was on, in 2016. It's available on our district's website. We typically do those eight to 10 years, so it's about time to do one anyway. And uh, we will have that information this school year because part of the strategic planning process um, in terms of securing the future was to look at enrollment trends, uh, boundaries, all of those things to start having those conversations. So we will be looking at, um, and, and for those listening in public, I said to examine them. I didn't say we're making any changes yet. Um, but to really take a look at that uh, and, and get the demographer's report. The demographer's report, in my view, last time was, was really fairly accurate. Uh, COVID threw some wrenches into that, but um, as we're looking at our overall numbers, they're in line with what we saw uh, prior to COVID, but um, we will be soliciting another report and we'll ask the board for approval on that expenditure in uh, the coming board meetings. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it. That brings us to the reports of the board. We'll go ahead and start it off with the superintendent report. And I'll try and uh, be brief just because we had so many. Uh, so uh, my full written report will appear in um, you know, uh, the board briefs. Uh, just a heads up in terms of personnel, we are required this time of year to post uh, certain things to the board agenda and also online. So you will see the IMRF compensation report is attached to the board agenda. Um, and we will also be posting the teacher and administrator salary benefits, uh, which will happen on September 22nd, which is prior to the October 1st deadline. So as public employees, we are, uh, there we are bound to post our salaries and uh, there are certain requirements for the position. We meet those every year and you can find those in our transparency page on the website. 
in terms of curriculum and instruction, we're thrilled to be able to welcome all, all of our families into our schools for curriculum nights. We had our elementary curriculum nights last week. Uh, I know Liz, myself, and several other administrators were making the rounds throughout the buildings. It was great to see board members there as well. Uh, this week, we have our middle school nights, which will be coming up, and uh, we're excited to welcome our middle school families for curriculum nights. Uh, finance, uh, Todd gave a very lengthy presentation, so we're not going to dive into that. However, I do want to update the board that we did put out uh, the lunch survey for elementary students. Mm -hmm. We've got about 1,100 responses so far, so uh, it's very, uh, <laughs> feel you know, strongly about lunch. <laughs> yeah, people feel strongly about it, and uh, you know, the data is coming back that not everybody wants lunch, but there are a significant uh, number of responses that, that are indicating they'd like lunch, so we will share that information once we close the survey with the Board of Education. We'll certainly post that survey online like we do all of our surveys, and uh, we'll start diving into that data. Uh, technology, student devices were ready for the start of the school year. Most of our application rostering was successful. Uh, we, there's always some hiccups though, but uh, James and his team did a really good <coughs> job of making sure that everything was ready to go. It is no small effort. I also want to compliment uh, Rod and Todd uh, from the district office. They also uh, changed a lot of projectors over the summer and made sure all of our wireless access points were ready to go. So uh, thank you to those two. Believe it or not, we're already starting a Power uh, PTC platform, which is our parent-teacher conferences that will be here before we know it. The school year does go fast, so uh, James and his team, we're busy working on that today, and so that is, uh, that's coming up. Uh, the Special Services Department, we would like to invite all parents of students with IEPs or those are, that are participating in the special education evaluation process to join our team for Key to Ed for a facilitated IEP training. It will be held virtually on October 11th uh, from 7 to 8.30 p.m. <coughs> I want to really commend Jessica and the entire team as a special education parent myself. The IEP meeting process can be daunting and we are really making an effort as a school district to make that a very collaborative and welcoming uh, event at, at your child's school. So uh, we encourage all parents to see if they can attend that. Um, and we'll put out tons of information on that. But um, it's a really big initiative that we're very proud of this school year and we want to continue to do that. In terms of facilities, referendum design and planning work continues with final material selections for the middle schools coming up. We recently held meetings on door hardware, plumbing, and electrical items. Soon we'll host the initial neighborhood meetings for Herrick and O'Neill. They will both be on September 26th. O'Neill will be at 5 p.m. and Herrick's will be on 7 p.m. We're also scheduled to be in this room on November 6th for the planning commission meeting. So that is really coming along well. I, I know Kirat, you had asked before when we were going to have those uh, parent meetings. So what we did, or excuse me, neighborhood meetings, we, we sent out uh, it, via the US mail notification. We've also asked the village to help us send that, that out for all the immediate neighbors. So we're looking forward to meeting with the neighbors, our construction management team, and also our owner's representatives to walk them through uh, the designs of the building and how that may impact the construction, their neighborhood as we go uh, through that. Public relations, um, we really want to pause and just thank our community groups. District 58 received hundreds of school supply donations from several community groups, including the Community Christian Church of Downers Grove, the Regional Office of Education, Catholic Charities, uh, Kim Eustace Group of Keller Williams, and several individual donors, many who wanted to remain anonymous. In addition, First Christian Church held two days of a school supply fair for our teachers where they could come in and select things for their classrooms. So we're very grateful for our community partners and want to publicly uh, recognize them. The annual report, uh, I want to thank Faith Bear. Faith has done an outstanding job filling in for Megan. Uh, completing the annual report in the student handbook are kind of the rites of passage for that office during the summertime. Uh, but the annual report is a very challenging thing to put together. Um, Faith did a wonderful job. It was mailed out uh, to all District 58 residents last month. Uh, we've been answering questions uh, for people people as they've asked or as they've uh, called or emailed and I, again that's uh, posted on our website as well. One of the plugs that I want to make sure that everyone is aware of in our community is the Glenbard Parent Series. Um, while it's called the Glenbard Parent Series because it initiated in District 50 or excuse me 87, it's open to all DuPage County school districts including District 58. 
We often try and put parent education things together and we'll continue to do that. But this is a very comprehensive program that covers several different topics for parents that are looking for suggestions and advice on how to raise their children through all various things that they may encounter. I would highly encourage anyone to really look into the Glenbard Parent Series. It is a phenomenal uh, list of events and, and, and again uh, if you're not tuned into that please continue to check our newsletters because we want to make sure that our parents have access to it it's free of charge it's a it's a great thing it's uh done in collaboration with the college of dupage which we all pay taxes into and it's just it, again it, it's what many parents are are looking for <coughs> and we encourage all of our families to check that out and then finally Oktoberfest. It's hard to believe, but here we are again this weekend. Our Education Foundation will be hosting Oktoberfest on Friday, September 15th and Saturday, September 16th. We're still looking for volunteers, so this will be my final public pitch. But uh, if you haven't had a chance to volunteer yet, please consider signing up. And we're very excited it will be held in the same place that it was last year in the library lot, in the lot uh, adjacent to the library lot by the, the train tracks. And I just want to thank our Education Foundation it is a lot of work to put this uh, event together. Uh, Kirat is a member of the foundation and the board liaison, so he certainly represents the board along with uh, several of us. And it's just a great event, and I, I personally want to thank all of them for what they do for our students and our staff members because, you know, when you look at this event, they also do the Harlem Wizard game, and then don't forget the 5K uh, Grove mm -hmm. Express on Thanksgiving. It, it's a lot of work that they uh, do and they volunteer their time, so we want to thank them. And then if you are able to volunteer uh, for a shift, uh, please consider doing so. That concludes the superintendent's report. Fantastic. Any questions or comments? Wonderful. All right. Mr. Drayfall, you're back up with the uh, monthly business and treasurer's report. I, you have the year-to-date report and treasurer's report in your packet. Uh, I will submit them as written. Uh, I think I've talked enough. But I am going to let um, we have some one action item uh, on the agenda that we want to go through and let Kevin Bardo kind of talk to that for a minute. So tonight in our uh, uh, recommendations for action, we have our first referendum uh, bid award. So it's bid package one, which is early order equipment. Um, it's essentially uh, knowing that some of the equipment takes quite a while to get um, still in this marketplace. Um, that's what it's for. So it's focused on mechanical equipment, electrical equipment, and fire alarm panel. Um, you may recall in the Puffer and Highland fire alarm last year that we weren't able to get to some of the components. So this is um, uh, that early order equipment. And um, the only thing that's different in there is uh, we did accept a deduct alternate on some of the mechanical equipment. Um, there really wasn't uh, a lot of difference in our entire team's opinion of a couple of pieces of equipment and considering the savings that we could um, you know, achieve with that, we felt that was worthwhile to accept that. Um, so the engineers, our mechanical engineering team did put that in there as an option um, for us to consider, but at the end of the day, we felt uh, we we're making the best decision there. So that's uh, bid package one for the referendum uh, equipment. Thank you, Any questions or comments on that? Appreciate it. Any questions or comments on the year to date report? Okay. All right, then the policy committee has not met since the last board meeting, and neither has the legislative committee. The financial advisory committee has met, though most of my thunder has been stolen already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did start off talking about both capital and playground updates. Uh, no major issues or anything going on with the capital <coughs> updates. Uh, playground, obviously, there were some uh, delays, the supply chain stuff, getting some equipment. Uh, I think just a, another reminder uh, about the importance of, of engaging with an owner's rep, making sure we really got people on time, and one of the reasons why we're engaging so early in, in some of this equipment, we've been watching those lead times, and we want to make sure that we have uh, access to these. Uh, it's that time of year where we do our the, the ESSA report, where, which is where we break down all of our spending by building, so we took a look at that. Um, we, there wasn't... <laughs> It was quite a spike this year in the what outplacement is because we've brought a lot more of that internal now. So the the kids that are outplaced are our most expensive cases. So we, we saw that go up quite a bit, but our overall cost on things has come down a little bit because we were able to bring uh, so many of those services back into the building. Uh, we looked at we spent a lot of time talking about the 2024 budget. 
We talked about the 35% um, uh, fund balance policy. Uh, we did talk about the fact that this budget is tighter than, than necessarily what it looks like on paper. Um, and so, you know, just things to keep in mind. Uh, we also did review, which I won't steal uh, Greg's thunder on, but we talked about the where we were with health and wellness <coughs> and the pharmacy. And then just kind of a review of the, the CPPRT, which we talked about earlier today, um, and the fact that those funds are coming down. We don't expect them to go back to pre-COVID, but we, we want to make sure that we're not budgeting um, where it was. And then another aspect that we talked about was this is probably the closest year we are to a normal year now after COVID when, it, when we're talking financially because so much stuff was still lingering on with, with policies in place for uh, sick days and everything else. But we still have one kind of thing lingering on and that is that we, this is our last year where we're gonna have ESSER funds that are covering some of those positions that uh, you remember the ESSER positions we had to create brand new uh, positions to, to solve the problem. So that's what we did. Um, there was some conversation about that today. We also talked about that for meeting. Uh, that concludes my report, but I'm willing to answer any questions. Okay. The uh, district leadership team met actually today, member one. Uh, yeah, uh, we met today and we kind of reviewed the strategic plan process and timeline because the last time we had met, I believe, was February, correct? Yeah, February 27th. <laughs> so uh, it had been a while, uh, so we dusted that off. And um, as the committee, we um, the administration updated the group, the district leadership team, on the five focus areas um, that we sort of work through, um, you know, with our strategic planning and our community uh, listening sessions and such, um, and sort of flushed out and talked about the progress made by those teams and then ask for our feedback on each of those and kind of walk through the five focus areas in order to um, finalize when the administration comes with their final recommendation for the wording of all the five key focus areas. Um, Karat, if you have anything else you want to add, but basically we're going to meet again October 9th and um, what we saw today was a draft and then on the 9th we're going to finalize it and then the final recommendation will come to the entire board um, at the board workshop October 23rd. Is that basic summary? Yeah. All right. Questions or comments? All right, Health and Wellness Committee met on August 31st. Vice President Harris? Yep, um, we have uh, just three kind of major um, Items of business to look to look at um, at a meeting such as this one. Um, first thing we look at is claims data from the summer. Uh, summer data is always um, always gives you a little jolt because uh, our stop loss insurance stop resets on Janu on July first, and then you also have a lot of, of our staff who had the summer off, and so they do their elective procedures in the summer. So uh, we we take a look at that, but um, the, really the, the big main pieces one of the, that the board is going to is going to look at tonight. The first one is our um, pharmaceutical benefits manager, um, which, uh, um, which is currently RX Benefits. Uh, we are, uh, the committee has recommended that the board um, switch to Aetna um, starting January 1st, Todd. And then um, that, that is um, projected to um, deliver us savings in the neighborhood of about a quarter million dollars, um, which is good for our plan. Um, that's, that's money that the, then the, the board and will have to less the board will have to pour into the, the medical reserve fund in the in the coming fiscal year but also that's that um, helps um, our members as well because that, that controls their premiums that they're paying um, the, on the employee side um, the other piece um, related to that is um, we have not we're not coming at, to this meeting with a recommendation for premium increases as of Jan 1 but we're still we talked about them a little bit we're gonna look at a little bit more data make sure that this gets approved tonight um, with the, the the benefits manager and then at the, at the October meeting the board can look forward to um, premium increases or premium adjustments for um, the, to vote on and approve for July 1st January 1st sorry yeah, January. <clears throat> and when did you say you want to bring those that will come at the October meeting, October meeting. and then just as a note um, typically I don't like to have a recommendation come on the same day that we would take action on something but this requires a 90-day notice so it is on the agenda today so I just want to make sure nobody had any questions on the changing of our pharmacy vendor I just have one question about that and I don't know if this never experienced anything like this I guess is did they talk about or 
address at all? Like, would there be any disruption to people? What pe is available to people in terms of prescriptions and things like that? If they're already on thing, like, is there any, yeah. was there so any discussion about that? Again? We have, we, it, they gave us a breakdown. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that there's not going, that we know that for some people the effect is going to be minimal. We know that for some people that the effect is going to, they're going to be, have, they're going to be, have to go onto a different drug of a, this, that a, accomplishes the same goal but doesn't, um, isn't what they're currently used to. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, so we did have, a, you know, the me the members on the committee, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not a voting member, but so I don't have a, a dog in this fight. But the members on the committee are all people who, ha who are, as we're talking about this, they're looking, they're looking at the list and looking at their prescriptions mm -hmm. and seeing well, how does it affect me, who is it affect somebody I work next to. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was there's that human piece that we did consider, um, but we, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, we feel like that the interruption is not insignificant, but something that we have gone through before when we switched to RX benefits, and then um, something we would, we would be able to navigate it again as well. And before RX benefits, we were on it. That's what I was going to say. And so then with RX benefits, now we're, because, oh, yeah. you know, just like your personal insurance, sometimes it's like, if you, once you stick around too long, then these start to spike, yeah, sure, so sure. Uh, now it was cheaper to go back the, to, to The uh, district did it three years ago. What happens is there's a disruption report, um, and the RX benefit, the, the, you know, the, the prescription manager will reach out to all of those individuals who have um, a piece that they may have to switch. And it's it's usually, it's a brand name change, right? Okay. And, you know, aspirin A is not on, on this list, but it's not on this list, so you have to talk to your provider about getting aspirin B uh, written as a script instead of aspirin mm -hmm. A. Um, that's, it, that, and that's what happened last time, it's what will happen again this time. Uh, they will reach out to everyone um, early into the process uh, before, much before January 1st, so that people have time to do that and get it before when, when, it, when the change happens. It, the early notice gives us the a chance to reclaim all of our rebates. We get uh, part of our thing is that we get all the rebates that the prescription manager gets from the drug manufacturers, mm -hmm. which helps keep premiums down. So giving them enough advance notice um, will, you know, save us a hundred thousand dollars or so in those rebates that will be coming back to us into January and February. I think a good way to think of it is um, the drug classifications mm -hmm. and what's approved and what isn't mm -hmm. all stay the same. Okay. You may see minor switches and I don't want to just say minor because someone's, mm -hmm. you know, medical thing can be impacted. <clears throat> but what we did do proactively is we sent all the staff a notice that this would be on tonight's mm -hmm. board agenda. We wanted them to know exactly what it is and, and quite frankly what it is not. Mm -hmm. And as Todd shared, over the coming months, we're gonna be working with staff. So by the time January 1st hits, everybody's had ample time to be prepared to have those conversations with their providers mm -hmm. to make sure that it's a, it's a seamless um, you know, transition. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Anything else, Greg? Nope. Appreciate it. All right, that brings us to the SASA report. Director yeah, just a really quick uh, SASA report. The committee structure for SASA has been updated. Um, so just like District 58, SASA has numerous committees and the superintendents who make up uh, the board there now will be serving on those committees. So um, I was nominated to be on the policy committee. For those who know me, I, that is one of my favorite areas. Um, so <laughs> I'll be on, somebody's gotta do it, right? Uh, but I'll be representing SASA on the uh, policy committee, but there are several other committees that the other superintendents will be on. Um, the search for a new director will be underway soon, and so we'll continue to keep the board apprised of that. As a reminder, SASA will come uh, to us this year and give a spotlight presentation. Uh, just an overall, um, you know, view of SASA and what they do uh, in conjunction with District 58 and for our students and the other member districts. One hiccup that SASA had at the beginning of the school year was uh, transportation. So they're still working through it, and I, I don't point the finger at SASID. Uh, Sunrise is the transportation provider, uh, just struggling with a labor shortage, and, and it is very, very challenging. I think every district is struggling with that. Um, we fared better than most because of some of the decisions and the relationships that we have, but certainly SASID um, did struggle with that, and, and we are working with any impacted District 58 families. I want to thank Jessica. She spends a lot of time on this, and her assistant Amy making sure, and, and so does uh, Todd and his department as well. Uh, but overall, I believe the interim superintendents have things headed in the right direction. That is a, about a 180 degree turn from where they were in the spring, and, and so we're pleased, but we're closely monitoring uh, the situation. Fantastic. Questions, comments? 
All right, that brings us to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but it's not intended to be a time for members of the public to engage in the dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to a future agenda or addressed by administrative and staff when appropriate. The board has allocated 30 minutes tonight for public comment. We ask that you keep your comments to a three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. Yeah, I didn't see any cards get placed over there. Um, so I will just open it up and say, is there anyone here who'd like to make a public comment? Should we do two lines this time? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That brings us to the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions tonight to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right. If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the August 14th, 2023 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes from the August 14th, 2023 regular meeting as presented. Next up is the con consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, would you please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. A couple of recommendations for action. First up is the 2023-2024 budget. Is there a motion to approve the 2023-2024 budget as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? I'm Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the 2023 through 2024 budget as presented. Next up is an amended school calendar for the 2023 through 2024 school year. Is there a motion to approve the 2023 through 2024 amended school calendar as presented? So moved. Second. All right. And uh, any discussion? Okay. Um, Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the 2023 through 2024 amended school calendar as presented. Uh, we have a recommendation to change the pharmacy bene benefit provider. Um, is there a motion to approve Aetna as the district's pharmacy benefit management provider effective January 1st, 2024? So moved. Second. Second. All right. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Uh, aye. The motion carried to approve the Aetna, uh, to approve Aetna as the district's pharmacy benefit management provider effective January 1st, 2024. Next up is the construction consent agenda. Uh, we only have one big package, so I don't have to ask if anyone wants anything separately. Right. But that's the only way to talk about it. So is, is there any? Anybody that wants to talk about the package when we pull it out? Okay. Is there that was a, a really motion? awkward way to do that. <laughs> is there a motion to approve the construction consent agenda consisting of the items as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. All right, let's please call roll. <laughs> Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried the consent uh, for the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. All right, a couple of announcements. Um, Tuesday, September 19th at 7 a.m., the Policy Committee will meet over at O'Neill Middle School. Uh, Wednesday, October 4th, 3.45 p.m., will be the first Legislative Committee meeting of the year at O'Neill Middle School. Friday, October 6th at 7 a.m., will be the next Financial Advisory Committee at O'Neill Middle School. Monday, October 9th at 3.45 p.m. will be a uh, district leadership team meeting at O'Neill Middle School. And then uh, Monday, October 9th at 7 p.m. Uh, will be the next regular uh, <coughs> board meeting. That'll be right here at the Downers Grove Village Hall. All right, the board will now move into closed session. Is, and I only need to do the minutes, right? Just minutes. Um, is there a motion to move into closed to discuss uh, for the discussion of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act? whether for the purposes of approval by the body of minutes or the semi-annual review of the minutes as mandated by section 2.06, that's 5 ILCS 122C21. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion on that? 
All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion carried. The board will now move into closed session. Uh, after a short recess, it's 8.48. Let's meet at 8.50.